Uh, welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. My name is Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Before I start my presentation today, I do want to emphasize our building is open, and I hope that you'll be inspired by this program and any other Curator's Corners programs to come to our building and see our exhibition in person. And as always, if you have a question or comment, please type it into the Q&A um, function of Zoom, and I will make sure to make time to respond at the end of my program, if not during my presentation. Today, I want to focus on a copy of Der Sturmer, a pro-Nazi anti-Semitic tabloid that we have on display in the second gallery of our exhibition. This was a newspaper given to the Holocaust Center by Alan Harter, who had received uh, it as part of a very large collection that was amassed by Edmund Tranker. Trankner, sorry. Uh, Trankner had worked in um, the New York Financial District for a company in the 1930s that, and part of his job, he received newspapers from all over the world. And after processing the papers, Trankner held on to many of them, creating and amassing an impressive collection of the newspaper coverage of the 1930s. In 1986, Mr. Trankner suffered a stroke and passed his collection to Alan Harder, who years later donated it to us, recognizing that although ugly and distorted, this newspaper um, had the power to alter the reader's perspectives about Jews and was part of an important legacy about the danger of hate and the danger of propaganda. So we have it in our collection. Today, as our country continues to struggle with racism and anti-Semitism, to me, this is an important reminder about the dangers of hate speech. Anyway, we are very grateful both to Edmund Trankner for amassing the collection and for Alan Harder for preserving it and donating it to HMTC. Here you see a full view of the pages we have on display in our gallery. Let's look at the masthead for some general information. Here's the translation of the larger text. You can see that Der Sturmer translates to the attacker. And you can also see that the subtitle for the newspaper was a German weekly newspaper in the fight for truth. So like many newspapers, it portrayed itself as seeking the truth, even as its pages were full of sensationalism and, and hate. The masthead includes the name of the editor and founder of the paper, Julius Stryker. And finally, you can also see that this is a copy of the newspaper from April, 1937. So 85 years ago this month, this month, which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it today. I don't have the exact date of when this newspaper was published because Der Sturmer was published as a weekly. Its first issue was published on a Friday, but often weekly papers would come out in the middle of the week on Wednesday or Thursday. We can see on here that this is the 15th issue of Der Sturmer in 1937. So this probably came out in the second week of April in 1937, right around this time of year. One more comment about the masthead, the small text to the left of the date mentions the subscription price, which was 20 fennigs, a copy or 84 fennigs for the month. There's also information about how to buy advertisement space. And then on the right, there's information about how to contact the editor and the mailing address in the center of Nuremberg. I should also say something about the typeface used in Der Sturmer. This is a font that's difficult to read today, even for native German readers. It is known as a fracture font with sharp angles and strong lines and was originally developed in the early 16th century for the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I in what the Nazis would later refer to as the First Reich. After the defeat of the Holy Roman Emperor by Napoleon in 1806, there was a gradual change through much of Europe, particularly for scholarly texts, away from the fracteur fonts and towards smoother and rounder antica fonts. And you can see a kind of comparison of these today. I think we're more familiar with the antica fonts today. But in Germany, with the rise of nationalism in the 1870s and again in the 1930s, many in Germany sought a return to the classic German Gothic fonts of fracteur. Otto von Bismarck apparently the, I'm sorry, Otto von Bismarck, the political leader of Germany in uh, the 1870s, who helped create the unified Germany in 1871, 
apparently refused to accept gifts of German books that were printed in Antica typefaces, returning them to their sender with notes that said, among others, I don't read German books in Latin letters. And in 1925, when Hitler published his book, Mein Kampf, he chose the Fraktur font to use for its cover. So Der Sturmer and other publications during the Nazi era in Germany turned also to that typeface with its connection to German history. That's the one they wanted to link to because of its connection to the first Holy Roman Emperor. But as I say, the flourishes and angular lines make it difficult to read to contemporary German speakers, even those fluent in Germany, uh, in German have a tough time, tough time with it. Let me go back briefly to talk about Julius Streicher, the founder and editor of Der Sturmer. Streicher was born in 1885 in Bavaria and fought in World War I. After that war, he was interested in politics and aggressively embraced anti-Semitism, blaming Jews for the loss of the war. In 1921, Stryker heard Adolf Hitler speak in Munich and was electrified. Stryker joined the Nazi party and from then on was an ardent supporter of Hitler. And recall that the Nazi party in 1921 was a, a fledgling party. It was a, a fringe party. Very few people were, uh, knew about it. It wasn't a large dominating power, but uh, Stryker was one of the early members. Stryker launched Der Sturmer in May of 1923. From the outset, the chief aim of the paper was to promulgate anti-Semitic propaganda. It rapidly established itself as the place where loud headlines introduced the most rabid attacks on Jews, full of innuend sexual innuendo, racist caricatures, and made up accusations of ritual murder. I should emphasize, however, that Der Sturmer was not the Nazi party paper. It was a private newspaper owned by an ardent Nazi supporter, Julius Stryker. The Nazi party paper, the official newspaper of the Nazi party, was the Volksscher Beobachter, the, which translates to something like the German People's Observer or the National Observer. It was launched in 1920 and published initially as a weekly and then beginning in February of 23 until April of 1945, largely as a daily. Stryker made Der Sturmer far more salacious and extreme than the Nazi party paper, if you can imagine that. I think you get a sense of it just from the name, the attacker versus the observer, and paper, maybe also from the observer. The Beobachter, which you see here, looks like a more serious newspaper. But Der Sturmer, despite Stryker's early support for the Nazi party and strong relationship with Hitler, was actually seen by many of the Nazi leadership as an embarrassment because of its vulgar style. In 1936, in the lead up to the Olympic Games, the sale of Der Sturmer was actually restricted in Berlin. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels tried to completely ban the paper in 1938, and Hermann Goering, the second most powerful man in the Nazi state, forbade Der Sturmer in all of his departments. He harbored a particular hatred for the paper after Stryker published an, art, an article alleging that Goering's daughter had been conceived through artificial insemination. In February of 1940, Stryker was stripped of his party offices and withdrew from the public eye, although he was permitted to continue publishing the paper and remained a member of the Nazi party. Regardless of the fact that Stryker and his paper grew increasingly isolated in the Nazi party, Hitler continued to be a strong supporter. He believed that while Stryker's methods were primitive, that Stryker was effective in influencing the common man. A look at the content of our page or of this page of Der Sturmer gives you a sense about Stryker's approach, I think. The big headline says Talmudic Jews and includes the subtitle, they wrong, steal, hide, rob, disgrace and commit all crimes against the laws of the non-Jews. The article goes on to describe the Tal a Talmudic scholar who after the Nazis came to power, became a moneylender and charged not only interest, but various exorbitant fees. But the article does not just heap scorn on this one moneylender, but claims all Jews are called on to take advantage of non-Jews. The text says, the law of Nazi Germany forbids usury, 
neither the creditor nor the debtor should be harmed at home. The law of the Jew demands the opposite. The article goes on to quote some Talmudic language that Der Sturmer claims says, the Jew may lend money to the Gentile, but only with usury interest. He should not help the non-Jew by lending money, but he should destroy him with it. The story is a real model of Stryker's approach to depict Jews and the Jewish religion as dangerous. The cartoon on the page emphasizes the same message, but with less reading. As you can see, it shows a stereotypical or a caricature of a Jewish man with the dark features, the slovenly appearance, the squinty eyes and enlarged nose. And flying behind the man in his wake is a representation of the Grim Reaper or disease or, or death. The Slayer is the caption, the, the title for the cartoon referencing that menacing character following this Jewish man. And the caption reads, a nation that keeps its borders open for every Jew will soon enough be hit with misfortune. The message is, is simple. Jews bring misfortune and are dangerous. And that message is also the one that Stryker made the repeating footer in all his newspaper editions. Die Juden sind unser Unglück. The Jews are our misfortune or the Jews are our, are our curse. By 1937, when this issue came out, Stryker had, as I think you can see, honed his message. And the combination of the lurid pages of Der Sturmer, along with the strong support of Adolf Hitler, made for a very successful combination. In 1933, when the Nazis came to power, Der Sturmer had a circulation of about 25,000 people. By early 1934, a year later, circulation had almost doubled to near 50,000 readers each week. The following year doubled again to 130,000, and by the end of 1935, readership was over 480,000 readers every week. And those figures actually are probably well below the actual readership, because copies of this newspaper were often put up in display cases in towns to increase their visibility. Here's a view of such a display case, this one in the city of Worms in 1933. The billboard heading reads, with with the Der Sturmer against Jews or against Judah. You can also see the tagline, the Jews are a misfortune that's above the actual copies of the paper. Ironically, the success of the Nazi efforts to remove the Jews from Germany meant that by 1940, there was less interest, public interest in Der Sturmer because the Jews had largely already been deported from Germany. Still, their Sturmer continued to be published until February of 1945. At the end of the war, Stryker, who you can see here, was captured and then tried at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. Even though he was not part of the military or political leadership, prosecutors contended that Stryker's articles and speeches were so incendiary that he was an accessory to murder and therefore as culpable as those who actually or or ordered the mass extermination of Jews. He was held accountable for what would later be classified as incitement to genocide. The court found him guilty of crimes against humanity, sentenced him to death, and then hanged him on October in October of 1946. Now, the reason we show this edition of Der Sturmer is partially due to this larger perspective about Stryker's role spreading anti-Semitism but it's also due to something that's on the back side of the page we display. Here you can see that most of the page is dedicated to an article about the Talmud, where Stryker goes on again about the evil nature of Jews and the secret things that Jews are taught. There's also a story about how Jews at Polish universities in 1937 um, are alienating non-Jewish Poles and one about the League of Nations, not being the work of Woodrow Wilson, but of a Jewish creation. There's also another telling footer at the bottom of the page. This one says, he who hates Der Sturmer hates the German people. It seems to me a strange phrase to use and a strange choice of language. Maybe a more traditional footer would have said something like, if you love the German people, you should love Der Sturmer, but he he stuck with the hate. Uh, he emphasized that hate. Uh, hate was certainly what made Der Sturmer um, tick, if you will. But none of those things are actually why we show 
this copy or this edition of the paper. Instead, we include it because of the photograph that is depicted. And here you can see an enlarged version of it. The caption explains that the photographs, photograph is of a pro-Nazi rally held in New York, a gathering of the Friends of New Germany. It is all too easy, I think, to forget that there was support for the Nazis in New York, particularly before World War II broke out in 1939. One of the strange things about the inclusion of this photo in the April 1937 issue of Der Sturmer is there is no other information about it other than the picture and the caption. There's no story that goes along with it, and there's no date on the photograph. One of the other strange things is that this photo from in the issue of April 1937 uh, describes it's the Friends of New Germany, but that organization had been dissolved by April 1937. In March of 1936, the Friends of New Germany had been disbanded and its membership transferred to a newly formed organization, the German American Bund. So this clearly is a photograph taken before March of 1936, despite the publication in April of 1937. I think it may well be a photograph from Madison Square Garden because we know of several pro-Nazi rallies that were held in the early 1930s in Madison Square Garden. Indeed, we have another photograph, this one, from the German Day program held in Madison Square Garden in October of 34. But this is not the same look as the photo in Der Sturmer. I know of this photograph also from the same day, uh, German Day in 1935. And while I haven't been able to find a photograph from the event in 1936, I did find this press release when the chairman of the American Olympic Committee told the crowd of 20,000 people at the German Day rally in Madison Square Garden that the American people could profit by a study of the Hitler regime. Of course, by 1936, in October of 36, as I said, the Friends of New Germany no longer existed. But there was at least one more big rally at Madison Square Garden before 1936, the one in May of 1934. The New York Times covered that event, and you can see it here. The headline on the lower left, 20,000 members of the Friends of New Germany gathered at Madison Square Garden to denounce a boycott of German goods that had been launched by the American Jewish Congress and a number of other groups in March of 1933. Perhaps the photograph in the April 1937 issue of Der Sturmer is from this rally in 1934. It's also that it's, it's possible that it's from the final big meeting of the Friends of New Germany which took place actually up in Buffalo in March of 1936. I haven't been able to find a photograph of the, the, what that event looked like in the inside. I think given the size of the space shown in the photograph, it was more likely to be one of the events at Madison Square Garden. But with only this one photograph to work with, it's hard to know for certain. I will add that there was another famous pro-Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden a few years later held on George Washington's birthday, February 20th, 1939. It was organized by the German American Bund, the organization which had taken over the membership of the Friends of New Germany in 36. And it was named after the Pro-America Rally. If it wasn't clear in that earlier picture, I've zoomed in here. So you can see here that George Washington's image is sandwiched between American flags and the Nazi swastika. The point in February of 1939 was to highlight some of the similarities between America and Nazi Germany. Flags in the stands said, stop Jewish domination of Christian America. And the keynote speaker, Gerhard Wilhelm Kunz, the National Public Relations Director for the Bund, spoke about the long thread of racism in American history to bolster his vision of a whites only America, citing anti-miscegenation laws, the Chinese Exclusion Act, Jim Crow policies and immigration quotas. He claimed, quote, it has always been very much American to protect the Aryan character of this nation. A couple of years ago in 2017, Marshall Curry and Laura Poitras produced a seven minute short documentary film about that rally in February of 1939. that um, was nominated for an Academy Award. The documentary is called, as you can see, A Night at the Garden. And it's available, I think, on YouTube. You can watch a free version of it. It's only seven minutes long, but it's quite powerful. 
getting back to our copy of Der Sturmer, uh, we included in our gallery because it highlights how the most virulent forms of anti-Semitism became acceptable in Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And we hope it reminds our viewers about the dangers of racism and prejudice, which can, under certain circumstances, blossom into a culture of hate that even sees murder as acceptable. But we also choose this particular copy to suggest that we in America should not feel so confident that it was something particularly German that enabled the Holocaust to happen. As this issue shows, hundreds of thousands of Americans in the early 1930s were openly supportive of Nazi racist policies and proud to put their views on public display. America, we know, followed a different path. Indeed, it was during World War II that Americans and the world saw the full dangers of what racism and hatred could lead to. Although 75 years have passed since the end of World War II, or more than 75 years now since the end of World War II, our museum ensures that we never forget those lessons. And given the times we're living in with racism and prejudice and anti-Semitism fueling tensions and violence in cities across the country, it's a lesson that we should all go back to and look at once more, I think. So I will stop there. Thank you for watching. If you have particular questions, of course, please type them in. Let me also take a moment to just put in a plug for some of our other upcoming programs. Next Tuesday, April 19th, we will have the first program in a new four-part series that we have entitled Laughing at Ourselves, Humor and the Immigrant and Minority Experience. The first program will be with the Chinese American comedian, Jocelyn Chia, who will share how she weaves her own immigrant story into her comedy and what response she's gotten from that. Then on April 20th, 8 p.m., HMTC is hosting a live in-person concert at Carnegie Hall, where as we approach Yom HaShoah, the new Manhattan Symphonetta Orchestra will perform the hymns from Auschwitz, including a world premiere of Michelle Asael's Auschwitz symphonic poem written in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust in Salonika in 1948, but never performed before. And one last program to mention, we will be hosting a virtual program in honor of Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day on Sunday, April 24th at one o'clock. As I'm sure you knew, no, April is Genocide Awareness Month, partially because of Yom HaShoah, which falls on April 27th and 28th this year, but also because of the Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day on April 24th. And the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center seeks not only to remember the Holocaust, but draws on key anniversaries to highlight the dangers of hate and the way hate has affected other groups around the world. So I hope you will join us for this program about the Armenian Genocide. You can find more details about these programs and a full listing of our upcoming schedule on our website at www.hmtcli.org. And please click on the uh, events tab. And one more thing, as you can see here, I hope you will also go to our website and click the Give Now button. Okay, let me stop sharing my screen and respond to some of your questions, which I have, see have come in. Were there any news articles of a general nature in Der Sturmer? Uh, generally speaking, no, Felice. The, uh, the articles were all pretty much meant to uh, fan the flames of hate against Jews. I mean, they might be about various things that happened in Germany, but they were all about using those events to fan the flames of hate. Was Der Sturmer also available in Austria after the Anschluss? Yes, uh, this was a newspaper that was circulated throughout the German Reich. Um, what resistance was there to the Der Sturmer by German people and other journalists? You know, the response by German journalists to the rise of Adolf Hitler was um, significantly muted by the laws that one of the first laws that was passed, I think it's in October of 33, was the editor's law, which required that any newspaper editor had to be Aryan and had to agree to uh, following the directions of the Nazi state in terms of what they would publish. And they could be removed from their positions if the Nazi state thought what they were doing something improper. And so while there were a couple of examples of newspapers that tried to, um, tried to buck the system or tried to use 
very subtle ways to suggest uh, displeasure of what the Nazis were doing. Most were quickly, quickly shut down. And so for journalists and for editors who continued to work in the field, they couldn't work in the field unless they supported the Nazi party. So uh, there wasn't much resistance possible, in fact. Um, another person asks, was Julius Stryker also the publisher of the uh, hateful book, the children's book, The Poisonous Mushroom? Uh, so yes, yeah, Stryker had a publishing company that he owned, uh, Sturmer Verlag, which published a number of children's books that I know of two that were The Poisonous Mushroom and also um, another book that we show in our gallery actually about uh, Do Not Trust the Jew on, the, on His Oath or the, I, I'm blanking on the full title. Uh, but yes, yeah, so he published those books or his publishing company. It wasn't published by the newspaper. It was published by a separate company that he founded as a publishing company. And um, yeah, so he was working in various forms to try and spread hate. He also, I think, published a book, particularly for teachers, on ways they should incorporate uh, anti-Jewish ideas into their teaching. So really a pretty unpleasant guy and did all he could to support the Nazis. Uh, why do I think the Madison Square Garden photo was included in this edition of the Sturmer, yeah, uh, of Der Sturmer? It's a strange thing. I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I find it pretty odd. I think it was probably an effort by Der Sturmer to highlight the international support for the Nazi party and the international opposition to Jews. And that was a way to highlight it, to show what was going on, even in America. What was the name of the short film? The film I was talking about was uh, it's called A Night at the Garden by Laura Poitras. And uh, yeah, I think you should be able to ease it, find it pretty easily. Um, I don't have, somebody's asking about where in Germany in particular was there stronger subscription information. I don't know that information. Uh, I, and I think that, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I just don't have the subscription information or where they were um, more popular, more well-read, I'm sorry. Uh, if Hitler supported Stryker, why did other Nazis dislike him? And, you know, that's a good question. And it's one where Hitler apparently ran counter to some of the other main leaders and main figures in the Nazi party. And uh, this is perhaps not unusual. I think Hitler and the, and the Nazi party, and, well, Hitler in particular, like to have kind of competing visions uh, at various different jobs in the Nazi state. And here also, maybe he liked the idea that there were competing ideas about who's about this newspaper and about the publisher and thought that somehow this um, the lack of unity was a good thing and that there was, I, that's all I can understand. I don't know why he stuck with it and others thought it was, that Stryker was not a good guy. I mean, we know what others thought that Stryker was a tabloid publisher and was not making the Nazi party look good, but Hitler liked the result. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, do I know if people in America read their Sturmer? Oh, that's a good question, Greta. I don't know uh, if it, I mean, obviously some copies were coming over to America, but I don't know what kind of percentage that was. Uh, an interesting point to raise. I'm sorry, I don't have that information. Okay, thanks very much for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you at other programs soon. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye.